Greetings, my name is Daniel Canepa. This is in honor of the truth. And today I want to bring a new video, a teaching, which is about prayer. It's about interceding. It's about spiritual warfare. And I'm bringing this video today particularly because of the need to understand how to fight spiritual warfare, how to do spiritual warfare, how to fight against things that we can't see, against spirits, against demons, against principalities. And we need help. This comes from um, something that happened a few months ago in my family, in this ministry, which was very tough. And I was in the need of finding a way to be more effective with my declarations, with the way I am attacking the kingdom of darkness and the way I'm pleading to the Lord. So this is for everybody who is interceding for the people of God, interceding for a loved one, interceding for a wife, for a husband, for a family member family member that's ill or maybe it's not yet a believer, hasn't been born again. So this is for all of you. I hope it's a blessing. So let's go ahead and begin. This is going to be 12 points. So we're going to start with point number one. The first point is recognizing in your mind and in your heart who you are talking to. You have to understand who you're directing your voice to. And first, let us go to the end, which is the last Last page of this, of this book, Revelation 22, verse 13. This is the words of the Lord. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So we have to understand who we're talking to. We're talking to the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who was from the beginning, who is, and who forever will exist. Because when he spoke, things came into existence. They, they just became, they were. He himself is who we are directing our, our pleading, our supplication to. We're asking him. He is our God, our heavenly father. But one thing we have to understand as well, that he is also a king. And a king deserves respect. And sometimes we forget that. Why? Because we've seen movies, uh, videos of a Jesus who is, you know, um, always smiling, always love, and, and we don't really see him as a king, but he is the king of kings. Yes, he came as a servant. He humbled himself to, to make a point, to make an example, to die for our sins. And what he did proved to the principalities, to the demons, and the devil himself that he demands, he deserves respect. He deserves honor. He deserves praise because he did that. He did that ultimate sacrifice. So he is the one who we're directing to our prayers to God Almighty who manifested in the flesh as the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we're talking to. Point number two is to enter his presence with humility. This is found in Psalms 51. Psalms 51. Psalm 51 talks about the repentance of David when he sinned, but we're going to focus on the last few verses here. Verse 15 O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I will give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Another, another uh, translation says a humble and contrite heart. So he doesn't desires sacrifice like a burnt offering. He desires praise, humility, worship, to come to him with a humble heart. Um, and we know that God doesn't listen to sinners. So if you're a sinner asking him things, he's not listening, unless you're a sinner who is repenting and you come to him with a humble heart. But that's a topic for a different day. So we come to the Lord knowing he's the king of kings, that he should be honored, he should be glorified, he should have all the credit. We humble ourselves before him. If you want to uh, humble yourself the way that you know how to humble yourself, you, you do it. And you do it as a little one in, in the Lord, as a little one in the kingdom. You know, just humble yourself before him. Understand that and understand if you, if you, if you humiliate, if you humble, if, if you have a broken heart and you, and, and you really, your heart is broken in his presence, you come to him, you're pleading for help, that he's not going to reject you. He's not going to put you aside. Number three, sing a new song. This is found in Psalms 149. When we come to him 
And we're about to ask the Lord something very, something very specific, something great. And you know that this is about a, a family or, or you're interceding for the people of God. And you come to him humbly and you start singing, you start worshiping. This is very important. And a lot of people, they start worshiping and singing songs that they already know by heart or you know, lyrics, sometimes lyrics that have been written by producers uh, who also you know, sing any other type of, of, of songs. And it is a lot better that you stay away from that. If you want to use a song that has been written by somebody as a foundation, may, I think it might be okay just as long as it's, it's somebody pure, that it was, it was a, they were ministering with purity, with the Spirit of God, and, and not just anybody. But then you have to start singing your own song. That's why I, I recommend not to, not to put music or anything like that. If that works for you, that's great. But let's read what the Word of God says. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the assembly of saints. A new song. Let's go over to... Okay, let's, just, let's go over. This is, I thought I was skipping, but you know what? Let me not skip. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. Instruments are very important, I think. When you're praising God and worshiping, when you have like a guitar or an instrument, uh, I'm not talking about drums. I'm talking about like n instruments that you can really, really uh, uh, get into his presence. And you're going to know. You're going to know if it's something that that is ministering to God because, because His Spirit pours down on you. For the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. See, there, that's what happens when you humble yourself and you start worshiping Him with new song. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Very important, not just to like praise him in your, in your thoughts, like, like, you know, in your mind, like everybody does. It's important to already establish this, that you have to declare, open your lips, your mouth. You have to declare the words. The way to get through the spiritual realm is through your words, through the pronunciations, through the frequencies, through what's coming out, the voice is coming out. You have to understand this. So when you're praying and you're interceding for people, and, when, and also where you're worshiping, you have to speak, you have to sing, you have to be heard. It's very important that you understand this. Why? Because, and a two-edged sword in their hand, because that's what happened, a two-edged sword in your hand, but really is, is the words. The word is a two-edged sword. The word is a sword that cuts through to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the people, to, the, to bind their kings with chains. So bind their kings with chains. We will understand this when we get to um, principalities. And what I'm going to start saying already is that this is prepping you for spiritual warfare. So right now you're praising the God. You're understanding that, he, that with your mouth, with the instruments, you're praising him. You're humbling yourself. You're worshiping him. But you're getting ready to, you're getting ready to fight as well. You're getting ready to fight. So right now you're directing to God. You're ministering to the Lord, but you're getting ready for war. Okay? Verse 9, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. This is what we're going to finish at the end. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's going to be something similar because in the end we're going to read that this is the, the inheritance of the saints, of the people of God, those who have the inheritance of salvation. This honor have all the saints. What, what do they have to bind their kings with chains and their chains and their nobles with fetters of iron? So we have the authority because we're the body of, of the Lord. We're the body of Christ. We are the church. So the head without the body is incomplete. Since we're the body here on earth, so we're executing. God gave us power and authority, so we have to put away the false humility. We are the body. Okay. So we have the honor. The saints have this honor to be able to execute. So meaning declaring the right words. Now let's go to same point. We're in, this, we're in point number three, which is uh, singing song. But let's go to Exodus 28. Exodus 28. 
while we're worshiping. Exodus 28. While we are worshiping, this is important to know. Verse 34. This is talking about the uh, robe and the clothes of, of Aaron. A golden bell and a pomegranate. A golden bell upon the hem of the robe all around. And it should be upon Aaron when he ministers. And it's, it, and its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord. And when he comes out, that he may not die. Why is it important to be heard so he doesn't die? As far as I know, God's the same yesterday and today. So this is not exactly the same way, but there is something important in being heard. That's, what I, that's the point I'm trying to make. The bells, he need to be, so he needed to walk around and the bells are making noise because he needed to be heard. He needed to be acting. He needed to be moving. So if you're, if you're worshiping God and, and, and then you're about to start doing prayer and supplication for the people, you have to be heard. There has to be noise. So that's why it's important sometimes to use an instrument. It's very, very effective, especially when it's ministering to God and especially when you're about to do warfare. Let's continue. You shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave it, engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. So this is like a seal. It's an engraving. Uh, and this was on, it says here, verse 37, and you shall put it on the blue cord that it may be on the turban, so on the head. It shall be on the front of the turban, so it shall be on Aaron's forehead. Holiness to the Lord on Aaron's forehead. And we know that we have the seal of God because we depart from sin, we depart from iniquity. So we're the temple of God now. We are the temple of God and we are holiness to the Lord. So this temple is supposed to be holy. So we understand this just like in, the, in uh, Aaron here, he was putting the clothes with uh, physical things. So not, now it's not the same. Now we are the temple and we are to be holy in our mind and the spirit and our body also holy. That's, what, that's, that's the similarity here. Verse 38, so it should be Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hollow in their holy gifts. So bear the iniquity. So he's beginning is, is to get ready to intercede for the people. Let's go on to Leviticus 26. And we're moving on now to when we're worshiping, when we're ministering to God, then we start asking. You know, we, we're, we're holy, we're living a holy life. This temple is holy. We come into God's presence with song, with worship. And now we start asking. And when you're interceding for somebody, it is okay to ask forgiveness for them. Just like the Lord said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. So the same thing we do, we ask, Father, forgive them. And here is very specific on, on uh, who we can ask forgiveness for. Chapter 26 of Leviticus, verse 39. And those of you who are left shall, shall waste away in their iniquities, iniquity in your enemies' lands, also in their father's iniquities, which are with them. They shall waste away. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with the unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me and that they also have walked contrary to me. Okay, so <clears throat> here's saying that they can ask forgiveness for the father's sins, their parents' sins. So here is just an example that we can intercede and we can ask God to have mercy on somebody, especially when it's a family member or a father. In my personal testimony, this happened to us. There was something very difficult happening in our family. And we interceded, we prayed, we fasted, we worshiped God. We asked God for forgiveness uh, for our family members. And this is what happened. God, God did listen and we saw the miracle. We saw the change. So the children should be asking forgiveness for the fathers and then vice versa, fathers also for the children, just like, uh, just like Job did. Job would make sacrifices every day, it says, uh, for his children, just in, in case they sin, just in case, like he wasn't sure, just in case. So same thing, we are interceding, we're asking God forgiveness because we, we don't do a burnt sacrifice now, but our sacrifice is in the spirit, is, is in our worship, in our words, in our humility towards God, in our worship, that is the sacrifice that the Lord re requires and that what He loves, because he, he loves to contemplate His creation that He created, worshiping Him. So he, he, God loves that, especially when it's done in a holy, a holy body, holiness of God, you know, the seal. When it's done that way, then He listens. 
And when we ask forgiveness for our fathers, for our sisters, for our brothers, for our, um, the people of God, ask forgiveness, just like Aaron would ask forgiveness, we can do that too. Of course, they're a separate individual from us and they have their own, their own uh, walk with God, but, but we still intercede. We ask God to have mercy on them. Okay? It's important to understand. So let's go to point number four, which is recognizing the threat of the enemy. Recognizing the threat of the enemy. That is in Psalm 64. So Psalms 64. Talking about the threat of the enemy. Okay. Psalm 64. Hear my voice, O God, in my meditation. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked one, of the wicked, from the rebelling of the workers of iniquity, who sharpen their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, bitter words that they may shoot in secret at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They talk of laying snares secretly. They say, who will see them? They devise iniquities. We have perfected a shrewd scheme, both inward, inward thought, both the inward thought and the heart of man are deep. So he's talking about they devise iniquity. They talk of, of laying snares secretly, secretly, sorry. So, in, in, the, in another translation, it says that they investigate and they do an exact measurement. They investigate. So that's what happens in the kingdom of darkness. The enemy knows our weakness. He knows what, what area we're weak in, and he targets that area. He's, he, it's like he sends spies. There's a, there's a hierarchy in the kingdom of darkness, just like there is in, in, the, in the kingdom of God. There's a hierarchy in angels, in principalities, and the demons. So. They make, they make uh, measurements, they make an investigation on you, and they see what your weakness is, and they attack you, especially if you're effective in the kingdom of God, especially if you're effective. So we have to understand that. So it's not like giving praise or honor to the enemy, but we have to understand where there is a need, what the attack is. So if you know a certain area of your life where you're being attacked, or, or the family member, or that person of God who you're interceding uh, for, you know, you kind of know where their weak spot is, but sometimes they don't see it, but you intercede, and, but you have to recognize where the enemy is attacking them. So recognizing that is very important, and it's key to, to start to intercede for them the right way. Okay, so we have to recognize that. Uh, point number five is plead for help and deliverance. This is when we start, so first we humble ourselves, we come to God, we start asking Him for forgiveness, for ourselves, for, for, for our family, for, the, for his people. We understand what the enemy's done, and now we start pleading. So we start, now we start asking him more directly. We start asking him with more strategy, strategy knowing that our words, our declarations are, are being heard, and it's very important that we know what we're talking about here. So that's in Psalms 108. So let's move on to Psalms 108. Psalms 108, starting from verse number one. God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise, even with my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples, and I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your mercy is great above the heavens, and your truth reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and your glory above the earth that your beloved may be delivered. Save with your right hand and hear me. Whenever the Bible talks about right hand, it's talking about the place of glory, the place of glory, your right hand, the place of glory, the place of honor, with your honor, with your right hand, with your glory. Um, so right here, we start asking for deliverance. We start pleading with the right words, more exact, more clear, more direct. You know, we're being more direct. And God already knows what we're asking because he he's our Heavenly Father. He knows our thoughts. But it's important that we declare the words. And it's important that we ask. So there is, is written. What we're saying is also being written by angels. So it's important 
that is legal, everything is legal in the kingdom of heaven. So that your beloved, your people, your beloved, whoever you're interceding for, may be delivered. So here you're, you're starting to plead. Number six, it's important to know also that we are the body of Christ. And that's point number six. That's in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter one is where we find that. Let's start from verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints. Again, with the inheritance, with the glory of the saints. We're going to understand this later. And what is exceedingly greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand, his place of glory, in the heavenly places. For above all, far above, here's the part, far above all principality, power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to, the, to be head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we are the body. We're, we're, the, we're the temple of God. We are the body of Christ. Christ is the head. So we're the same body. You know, he executes... He has to get through us here physically, here on earth, as, a, as it is in heaven. So he guides us where his body, we move, we execute. And he is the head above all principality, power, might, and dominion. So we have to understand what authority, we're talking about authority here, what authority he has. So we're, we're part of, he's the head and we're part of that. We're the body of Christ. So again, Put away the false humility and understand the authority and the power God's given you. Which is the next point, our authority. And it's found in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The reason it says serpents and scorpions is because these animals, these beings, they're, they're on the earth, you know, they're on the dry places, just like demons. So demons, we know they don't operate in, heavenly, in the heavenlies, they operate here on earth, they go to dry places. It says when a demon or unclean spirit goes out of a man, it goes to dry places. And what other animal goes to dry places to make an example of, of this, of demons? serpents and scorpions. That's why. It's not literally talking about serpents and scorpions and stepping on them. It's talking about demons. So that's the authority that God gives us. Now, let's go on to the celestial regions. Understanding about the celestial regions. It is found, in, again, in Ephesians chapter 6. Let's go back. Chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So this is talking about hierarchies. I mentioned hierarchies earlier, and hierarchies is literally like soldiers, like warfare, because as a king, the kingdom of God is made out of hierarchies, and so is the kingdom of, of darkness. We have to understand that the devil only took a third of the angels, so we have the upper hand. With the Lord, we always have upper hand. And, but we still can't, we, we can't deny the fact that there is still a hierarchy. So there's principalities, there's powers, there's governors, there's generals, there's captains, there's soldiers, there's spies. And this is a hierarchy that works in, in, the, in the heavenlies. So why, why does it say the heavenlies? Let's go to Ephesians chapter two, verse two in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, the prince of the power of the air. So the devil operates in this heaven, in the space above us. That's where he operates. So we have to understand that what we're dealing against, what we're coming against, and knowing that our, our prayers need, need to penetrate that, penetrate the, those spirits, that are in the heavenlies, and there's a fight up there going on. And what happens up there manifests down here. 
So our words is what penetrates that. And we're going to read that next, which is point number nine, the battle in heavens. That's found in Daniel. Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10, starting from verse 12. This is when, the, when Daniel uh, was seeking the Lord and asking. And then after a while, and after, after many days... After three full weeks, the angel of the Lord came. Verse 12, Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your Lord, your words, see again, it's talking about humbling yourself. Just back to point, point number two, which is to humble yourself before God. Humble yourself before God. Your words were heard, and I have come, the angel, because of your words. But... So this is a part that we were talking about, the prince of the power of the air, and the principalities, the, the, the princes of the darkness. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia would stood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. Like this looks like, this sounds like a, like a movie or something, things we, we, we watch in Hollywood. Well, I mean, there's a lot they know, and, and they show us that this is actually based on truth. But, you know, they, they show it as, as magic and as, as something false. But, but they know what's going on. They know what's going on um, spiritually. So there's warfare in, in the heavens. And an angel of God wanted to come and give a message to the prophet Daniel. And he had to fight with the prince of Persia. And it was difficult. So he took like three weeks. So then another angel, an archangel, a powerful angel, had to come and help him. So he can get through and the message could be, could be given to Daniel. You see? There's a lot going on that we don't understand. That's why we, all we can do is just be like children and believe in God. So our words, our declarations, our prayers are heard, and we do damage to the enemy. Let's now go to verse 20. Okay, so he gave him the message, and then the angel has to go back. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight the prince of Persia. So he came down, he fought that prince, which it says the prince of Persia, because one thing you have to understand is that people... People who are very wicked, especially people of influence, powerful people, rich people that are, that are doing wicked things, um, influencing the mass, controlling the mass, especially uh, I can name a few the, who but I don't want to get into that right now. They are influenced and they are being um, moved and swayed by principalities. So the prince of Persia was most likely the being, well, the prince of Persia that was, that was in the heavenlies was also operating through the Prince of Persia, literally that was on the ground. This is what happens sometimes. A lot of, a lot of people who are very wicked, who are, are, um, are operating under this one world government, and they want to do that, you know, the, the, they, someone call them the Illuminati. Well, the leaders, the people who are higher up, they are actually not, it's not even their plan. They, they come up with all these schemes, and people think, you know, it's all their plan. No, it's the enemy. It's the devil who gives his soldier, his, his princes, this, this command, this order, and they go and they influence these people here on earth to, to, to actually go forth and, and execute the order. That's what's going on. That's what always happens. You think these people come up with these like, wicked ideas? You think they come up with this? No, like the enemy plants it in their minds and he sways them to do that. So that's why it says here, the prince of Persia. I mean, it's like prince of Persia, but you mean a king? What do you mean he had to fight? He's talking about a principality, an angel, but yeah, but it, on, on earth it manifests what the principality was controlling, was, was moving that person to do. Okay, let's move forward. And when, he, when I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. And then another, see, another prince, another principality. But I will tell you what I've noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince, the angel of God, Michael. So this is serious. When we, ask, when we ask the Lord for angels, uh, you know, protection, sometimes we, when we declare, when we say, you know, the God to protect our children, we say, you know, for, for the angels of the Lord to surround them. This is real. This is literal. God executes and his angels, God, I'm sorry, God speaks and his angels execute. That's what we're going to talk about next. And is point number 10, which is the task of, of the angels or the function of the angels. And that's exactly what we're talking about. We're going to go to Psalms 103 for that. Psalms 103. 
Psalm 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, you, his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word. They do his word. Heeding the voice of his word, bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his, who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, my soul. So he speaks and his angels execute. Um, it says, you know, God, God has conversations with his creation. Like uh, in the Bible where it says, let us make man in our image. He was talking to his angels, just like he always has. Uh, when Job, when he was with his angels and then came, came Satan also, he was having a conversation. And he had a conversation with Satan. And in uh, 1 Kings uh, 22, it also says he, he inquired about what will ha how, who will go and, and deceive the king so he may be killed off. And then an, an angel came and was a ministering spirit who became a spirit of deception, of lying. So he, the prophets will, will speak false prophecies. So God inquires, he, he talks to his angels, and he speaks, and they execute. That's what he, in the beginning, he was, he was, that's what he was doing. It wasn't, he wasn't talking to the Trinity like a lot of false teachings say. It was talking to his angels, because they were created before the foundation of the earth. Okay, let us now go to the next point, which is point 11, proper declarations. The proper declarations is very important. It is in Romans chapter 8. The proper declarations or effective declarations, when we're praying, when we're interceding for the saints or loved ones, so you know, we, we minister to God, we, we praise God, we worship God, and then we start asking the Lord. We understand our enemy, we know, we know what the enemy's done, we know the functions of the angels, and then we start declaring, so we turn our attention, so then God starts pouring on us. He starts pouring His Spirit, and He guides us to prophesy, to say, to execute the word. And when we're declaring the words, remember, it's, it's, you can't just be, it can't just be a prayer in your mind. You have to declare the words. Then his angels come and execute because he gave you that authority. You have to understand that authority. Okay? Romans 8. Let's go to Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It's talking about speaking in tongues in this particular part, but in general. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God so who is making intercession for us? Who is interceding for us? I'm going to show you right here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10. 10, verse 19. Okay, verse 19. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about, or, about how or what you shall speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you shall speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. So, so highlight that. Spirit of your Father. So who in, who's doing intercession for you? Spirit of your Father tells you what to speak. He guides you on what to speak. Don't think about it. So the same thing when you're praying, you're interceding. Yes, you are thinking, but there comes a point where He pouring on you and He guides you on saying the right declarations. So, so what you're saying... If, if God is in approval of what you're saying, his angels execute and it gets done. It becomes as it is, as it is in heaven, you know, it manifests here on earth. So, but he guides us to speak the right words. The spirit of your father. Let us go now to Luke, I'm sorry, first Mark 13. So Mark 13 to see the same the same testimony here, a mirror of that, 13, verse 11. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak, but whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. So first it was a, your Father, your Heavenly Father. Now it's the same thing, we're talking about the same thing, but it says, but the Holy Spirit, 
Okay, so I hope I'm making sense here. Highlight that. Highlight who is interceding here, the Holy Spirit. And before I said, your Heavenly Father. Now let's go to the last example, which is talking about the same thing in Luke 21. Luke 21, verse 14. Therefore, settle in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I, I will give you, will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Okay, so I just want to make that very clear. Three examples of the same thing that Jesus said, the Lord said. He intercedes for us. Who? Your heavenly Father will guide you on what to say. Who? The Holy Spirit will guide you on what to say. Who? I. And who was I? It was the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same. God is one. So who intercedes for us? The Spirit of God. God himself guides us on how, how to speak, how to pray. If you're doing these steps correctly, if you're doing, if you understand who you're talking to, if you humble yourself, if you come with him with praise and worship, you, you, you ask the Lord to forgive, forgive our sins or forgive, forgive you, whoever you're interceding for. You understand what's going on, what the enemy's done, and you start declaring the right words, and, and he guides you in what to declare. All right, let's go ahead and... There's in Ephesians chapter three, something I wanted to point out here within. Okay, so Ephesians chapter three, verse 10. To the intent that now the, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So when we're doing the proper declarations, we have to understand that God is guiding us to talk and say the right things. Remember, now he's pouring down on us. He's guiding us. And now we are switching our attention to the enemy, to the kingdom of darkness. And he, he guides us on what to say to break chains, to cancel curses. And to the intent that, that now the, manifest, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church might be made known the wisdom of God to who? To the principalities and powers and the heavenly places, what we talked about in the heavenlies. So we're doing war against them. Okay? Last point, 12, is recognizing your inheritance. That's in Hebrews chapter 1. When we're praying and we're interceding, it is very important to know that you're not alone. Yes, you're not alone especially when you're with people with you ne left, uh, next to you, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about angels. Chapter 1 in Hebrews, verse 7. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels and his ministers a flame of fire. Then on verse 14, are they not also ministering spirit sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Will you inherit salvation? Are you, are you in, that, in that category? I hope you are. If that's you, if you will inherit salvation and persevere till the end, then this is for you. Then you're not alone. You have the angels, uh, two, two thirds of the angels, which is a lot. And you have these ministering spirits, these flames of, of fire who are on your side when the Lord guides you and he approves your prayer and you attack the kingdom of darkness who is, is, uh, is causing affliction in your family and that loved one and the, and the people of God in general, whatever it is that you're interceding, whoever it is you're interceding for, you have to understand you're not alone, that you have these angels who are at your service sent forth to minister for those. So they're in the service of us. They help us. They fight with us. And they want to fight with us because they have a free will and, and they, they know they have to obey the Lord when he speaks and he approves. And let us finish now with Psalm 104. Psalm 104, just talking about the same thing. Verse 104, verse four. Who makes his angel spirits, his ministers of flame and fire. It's just, it's just another confirmation, another testimony. His angel spirits. So his angels become spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. That's why when a lot of times when you're, well, this is a separate topic, just really quick, whenever you're praying for someone for, in, 
for deliverance, for demons to be cast out. A lot of times the demons scream because they're being burned, literally being burned in, in the spiritual. They're being burned and, and there's flames of fire. So angels come to your aid and they're burning them. So they have to come out. They're, they, they're being yanked out. They're being burnt out. Um, so these are the 12 points. This is something I wanted to give you. It is not, it doesn't have to be exactly in this order and the Lord will guide you on being effective, but this is something that worked for me and for the people that were with me who we were struggling and the Lord led me to these 12 points, which is, is something that is, should not be new, but it is important to note. If it worked for me, it can work for you as well, especially when you're talking about a loved one who you're interceding for, for, for them to be also, for them to believe, to repent, for, to be born again, especially for that, it's the most important thing. When a sinner repents, that is the most important thing. But also when you're talking about uh, sickness, affliction, and you're asking for freedom, this is a way to do it. When you're, when you're canceling uh, witchcraft, when you're canceling curses, when you're pleading for the deliverance, for the freedom, for the healing of, of somebody you love, this, this really does help, especially when the family gets together and does this. And, and then when you add uh, fasting to this, even more powerful. So this is the reason I'm doing it, because in these days, there is a lot of fear, a lot of confusion, and, and, we ha and, and the Lord is, is still calling us. He's still being merciful, but it is like he told me before. He told me his last call to repent, last call to repent. So it's important to be interceding the right way. And this is a way to intercede the right way. And I hope it's a blessing for you and your family. And I will see you on the next video. God bless you.